Hi, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you to um, to our conversation, a conversation around care, matters of care, um, questions of care, caring matters. Now, this is an ongoing conversation that we're having um, supported by the um, a Creative Europe program. Um, to bring together several ethnographic, so-called ethnographic and work cultures museums across um, Europe to think again about their collections. This has been a part of an ongoing conversation that several ethnographic museums have been having over the last 10 years or so, even more. We've been in very many collaborative projects. The previous one was, was called um, Switch, sharing a, um, um, Switch, which that project allowed us to bring the ethnographic museums together with questions around migration and questions of belonging within Europe, mindful of colonialism as a, as a shaping factor within our European polity, within European history. After that project ended, and we as museums started to think this project, a new project, we of the colonial, which still attends to the work that we are doing as ethnographic museums in the present, but rather to conjoin that with another anxiety, an anxiety over the futures of our planet itself and futures of planet and the people living in it. So we thought of trying to pull together questions that animate European presence now. What does it mean to be European? Who is constituted as the European or understood as the European? In a, in a sense, we are asking the question coming out of a history of colonization, who is even understood as humans? And we conjoin that with another anxiety that we are feeling and kind of anxious politics that animates European politics today, but world politics today, and that is climate futures. So we're thinking pull together plural futures together with climate futures as two anxieties that are interlinked. Very often we think these as separate questions. Or for us in ethnographic museums, we are aware that much of the precarity that is brought to bear from climate um, anxiety, from our bad relationship with the planet in the past, is borne by indigenous um, communities the world over. Our collections, in our collections, sits um, indigenous knowledges, ideas of how to deal with climate, how to deal with the world. And we wanted to try and go into these collections and try to attend to what futures could they help us to sketch that are more caring and careful futures. In this project, these 12 museums and one organizational partner, we push beyond thinking the museum as a site of preservation to try and develop an ethics of care, to think of the museum as a space for care, for caring curation, for caring um, um, exhibition practices, for caring collecting, and what that might mean. For us, it is a suggestion, a hinting, a speculation that that might that care might move us a little bit away from the overemphasis that we sometimes have about preserving the integrity of objects to thinking again about what it might mean to protect the integrity of us as humans as we live it with the um, more than human world so over the next couple of days four days actually not a couple but four days we'll be involved in a conversation about this. What might an ethnographic museum look like differently if care becomes the core of its intellectual and practical reorganization? How does this affect our relationship to questions of restitution, to questions of exhibition, to questions of just even simply what we do with um, the, the, the building as such, as a as a as a as a as a or buildings to make them more environmentally just. 
The conversations will go through a set of conceptual ideas. First, we start today with questions of environmental justice. We want to foreground environmental justice also as a kind of critique of some scholarship on the Anthropocene that seem to very often miss the work of indigenous um, actors in fighting for better climatic futures, miss the work of indigenous actors in thinking about indigenous communities in, in bearing the brunt of climate, um, climate change. Tomorrow, we engaged in questions around extraction and extractive economies to try and think what the museum could look like differently if it were to deal with its history of extraction, not just of um, um, extraction as part of the colonial regime, not just in the movement of objects, which we are complicit in, but also in the ways in which we might have participated in the extractive regimes of resources that now um, are in some of our museums through the objects that we hold. So I want to invite you all to speculate with us, to think with us as 12 museums across Europe, as we try to reorganize ourselves as institutions to imagine better futures together through the museum as a site of care. Today, we will have three speakers who are going to bring us into a conversation around environmental justice. They will be Kyle White, and Kyle is a professor of environment and sustainability, um, and George Willis Pack, um, professor at the University of Michigan School of Environment and Sustainability. We will have Heather, Dr. Heather Iglo Liorti, um, and Inuk from um, Nanosar Foot. Sorry, I, I left my glasses this morning, and holds the Tier One University Research Chair in circumpolar indigenous studies. And we want to invite Rolando Vasquez and is an associate professor at sociology and diversity fellow at the University of College um, Roosevelt and affiliated with the researcher at the gender studies department at the Research Institute for Critical Inquiry and Faculty of Humanities at, at, at Utrecht University. These presenters will speculate with us for 20 minutes each. And in their speculation, we will after that have conversations. The conversations are open. We have invited them not to come up with solutions, but rather to push us to think otherwise about what is at stake in the work we do. I should also say that these three thinkers are not just invited thinkers from somewhere, but they, are, they have become friends of the research center, friends of our museum, the Tropa Museum and our um, three other museums. They have become what we call in our own practice, complicit in trying to think through, to work through what better futures can be. I want to just one technical note. Um, if you do have questions, then send your questions and I will moderate those questions to the speakers. And also, I want to just say thanks to um, the people who are working in the background to try and make this conversation work for all of us. So I look forward to the conversation. You have to ask questions. That's one part of our rule. We can invite people and you don't ask questions. And to start out, I want to say welcome to Kyle and say welcome back because you were here before and ask you, Kyle, to start out with provoking us to imagine what we could be better as institutions. Thank you. Bonjour, everybody. I'm just uh, speaking to you all from the Anishinaabe Territory, uh, Michigan, and I wanted to, to thank the Research Center for Material Culture and Dr. Modest and all the fantastic colleagues. It's really amazing to have a chance to connect with this community again, and I really value our relationship moving forward and the things that we can do together. In this presentation, I'd like to combine some recent work that I'm doing on climate change with some thoughts about how I think it relates to exhibition spaces. Uh, and so I'll talk a lot about climate change because that's primarily the area of scholarship that I work in, but I really think that some of these ideas 
are ones that can be provoking to people that are in the position to, to curate and uh, create spaces in an exhibition sense. So I'd like to start off and uh, give you a bit of a, a background in terms of, you know, how I come to this uh, topic of thinking about time um, and, and how it relates, relates to the ways in which uh, space is presented, that exhibitions are, are curated, created, and, and designed. And one of the concerns I've had with, with climate change, which again is going to be a concern I have with exhibition spaces, uh, is that oftentimes we're really, really stuck in doing everything according to like a linear clock. Uh, so no matter what we're talking about or no matter what we're creating, uh, we're always assuming that it's being measured uh, or the duration occurs across some like type of standardized units, uh, like years or decades or, or centuries. And in my work more specifically on climate change, the you know concern that I've had, and again, this is more in that, that part of my work, not what I'm going to focus on necessarily here. Uh, but when we just think of climate change impacts as, you know, occurring across decades or, or years, it's a very European, it's a very US or Canadian settler conception of how to think about change. And it actually misses the way in which indigenous people, but also many other groups, uh, tell stories about climate change and narrate climate change and tell their own time about what climate change is. And so I've increasingly become concerned actually that when people tell time just in a linear fashion, it actually has an impact on their capacity to care uh, and to care about the situations of other people uh, with regard to climate change. And so in other work I actually show that because people oftentimes assume that the only way to tell climate change is through linear time that it creates a sense of urgency which allows folks who subscribe to that way of talking about climate change uh, to actually ignore how renewable energy projects uh, can often be uh, violent and problematic for indigenous people and other groups to the point where those solutions really aren't solutions for indigenous people at all. And so when I was thinking about how to go about this topic, and this is where I'd like to enter more into the, the content of this uh, particular presentation, I was thinking, are there other ways to, <laughs> to, to tell time? Um, and uh, so I've been working through, uh, you know, at least four different ways of actually telling time where you don't actually have to rely on a ticking clock. And these types of, of, of telling time uh, actually enhance our sense of, of care and later on what I'm gonna call kinship. And so I briefly wanna talk about these different ways of telling time and, and actually what I'm hoping that folks can, uh, uh, can think with me on here uh, is uh, how these different ways of telling time re relate to uh, how we construct or design or, or curate space. Uh, and, and a relationship between time and space and that, that, that creative process, that, that exhibition design uh, and experience process. So the first one is, is depth or immemorial time. And so I first was thinking through this uh, with respect to uh, uh, climate change, but I was also thinking in dialogue with indigenous studies scholars like Mark Rifkin, uh, who are publishing important work on different assumptions about time. And so I was thinking, you know, if the green is like several hundred years, which if we're thinking about this from like a United States uh, context, and then like the, the, the more red is like several thousand years, uh, then what we get right is that there's a colonial conception of time uh, where like say in the United States, the current climate threatened period is, is really referring to like the industrial period uh, and the bulk of the history that's enclosed within education, other processes. It's really about that uh, two or 300 year period. And obviously depending on the, the nation or the context that period can be 
uh, much longer. But then anything that comes before it is just a very like, you know, uh, kind of dark or obscure um, period. And th the idea is that because uh, climate change as it's being experienced right now comes across as a disruption to that, uh, you know, period of time over the last couple of hundred years, it appears as something that is, is new. Uh, it appears as something that's unprecedented. And I was contrasting that actually to how indigenous people tell time in relation to climate change, where it looks a little bit more like this. The current kind of climate threatened period is actually part of a much longer history that historically had climate threatened times that are firmly rooted in people's memories and in stories of communities. And so climate change today is not necessarily something that is best understood as unprecedented or, or new, uh, but is something that we have to face again and that we want to rely on the wisdom of our ancestors and the lessons that were learned uh, to be able to think through uh, what it means to be a society that's sustainable or resilient to climate change today. And so when I was thinking about this conception of time, I, I was realizing that for a lot of indigenous people, at least the ones that I know, uh, you know, especially for, for Potawatomi and Anishinaabe people, uh, we, we really have kind of a, a, a predilection to not assume that anything that might appear to us to be new uh, is indeed uh, new. <laughs> um, you know, so for example, an exhibition space on climate change where climate change today is considered to be the newest or most unprecedented disruption, uh, I would think is antithetical to this way of thinking where at least in my experience uh, with folks in my community uh, and with others who I know, uh, it would be presumptuous to assume that uh, something that we might experience as, as different uh, must be new or it must be the, uh, the first time. And indigenous studies scholars like Gene O'Brien uh, oftentimes refer to problems of, of one group of people always wanting to claim that when they perceive something as different, it's new and it's new for, for everybody in the world, right? It's, uh, her concept is called uh, uh, firsting. And so, so anyways, this was one conception of time that I had uh, uh, thought through, um, which I just call depth time, or you can call it immemorial time. From there, I began to think through um, other types of time in, in my work, especially as it relates to uh, indigenous knowledge and climate change and the indigenous-based research that I do. Most of the conversations I have with the, the communities and peoples that I collaborate with, uh, we're talking about time in relation to seasons. And I think for a lot of indigenous people, you know, especially Anishinaabe people, uh, our governance system is, is rooted in a social organization that's tied to being as adaptive as possible to seasonal change and then you know trends in seasonal change uh, over you know over time and so one of the things that i i tried to to think through carefully right is well what does it actually mean to to not view the the transition in time through uh two years or decades uh and just think about seasons and my colleague samantha chisholm hatfield has done you know important work on uh talking to elders about their perceptions of seasons which i encourage people to uh to look up and review and so what i found actually is that seasonal time is not just a way of telling time in which uh, you know, uh, fall starts at this time or it rains at this other time. It, it, that would just be another form of, 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 of linear time or of, of clock time. Rather, seasonal time works a little bit differently. So when I've talked to people about seasonal time, it's really this idea that there are cues and changes happening in the environment around us. You know, for example, uh, a plant does something, a, a fish does something, uh, there's a change in the, uh, the forest ecosystem, uh, a change in precipitation, right? So there's all these cues and changes and things are happening at different times in relation to each other. Uh, but the point is not actually that the, the changes must be understood as like causal changes, like, you know, one thing caused the other. Um, 
rather when we talk about seasonal time, right, somebody might say that, um, you know, when the fish start running or when a particular plant appears or a particular plant does something, you know, then there's a ceremony or then there's a harvesting activity. Or, you know, they mentioned some group activity or some community activity that not only brings people together, but brings people together with uh, non-human relatives. And so seasonal time actually is the, the time in which we don't just talk about, you know, fall and spring, but we talk about social human coordinated activities uh, that are constantly shifting and changing throughout the year. And those activities are tied to taking care of the environment. And oftentimes when people talk about the social activities, they talk about how they're sustained by kinship relationships. Now for me, a kinship relationship is actually, a, it's a caring relationship, but specifically a kinship relationship is any relationship that when I uh, carry out uh, the, the actions that are tied to the relationship, uh, it actually improves overall the resilience or sustainability of the community that I'm part of. And so a kinship relationship is not necessarily written down as a law or a code. Uh, it, it's, a, it, it, you know, to, for lack of a better word, kinship relations are informal uh, in a certain sense, and they take time to develop. But they're ones that when you have a lot of kinship relationships around you, it means that you're part of a community that can do its best to support uh, the well-being of all of the members of that community, whether human or more than human. And so a common kinship relationship is a responsibility. And so oftentimes when people talk about seasonal time, they talk about shifts in responsibilities throughout the year. My responsibilities at one part of the year are different from my responsibilities in the other, uh, other parts of the year. And those social activities are ones, you know, say it's a ceremony in which responsibilities may be affirmed, or if it's a harvesting activity, the responsibilities are being carried out. Uh, and, 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 and so in this way, right, a responsibility is are, you know, part and parcel of what it means to care for the environment. Now, kinship relationships are not just you know, at the level of a responsibility. A responsibility is really only meaningful if it's tied to a number of other qualities. And so when indigenous people, uh, uh, and this is definitely true of Nishnabe people, and I know uh, a lot of other indigenous people that I've connected with uh, speak a bit similarly to this, though in their own uh, register. Um, you know, when I carry out a responsibility, I respect the animacy of the non-human world, uh, or I respect the independence or self-determination of other people. So consent is a part of carrying out a responsibility, or trust is, uh, right? It's easier to carry out a responsibility if the, the different parties, the, the relatives of the responsibility trust each other. If there's an expectation of reciprocity uh, that we'll all have each other's back, it makes the responsibility better. And so in this way, right, kinship is a really complex moral system that involves, uh, you know, types of relationships like responsibilities, but then understands that they're meaningful when you have long-standing practices of consent, trust, reciprocity, but there are also others too, that it's not just those, those three. And so when you have a society, for example, where there's a premium on consent, a premium on trust, a premium on reciprocity, that society is gonna be responsive going back to the cues and the changes that are happening around you. So when I think of something like climate change, I wanna be living in a society where there's a lot of consent, <laughs> a lot of trust and a lot of reciprocity. Because even if the climate change is really bad, I know that uh, myself and other members of the society, human and non-human, will be able to do our best as opposed to society, societies where those qualities are uh, either taken for granted or those qualities are non-existent. And so this leads me to another type of time with this kinship time. Uh, native folks, especially a lot of elders, but many other people too, uh, can actually just tell time through changes in kinship relationships. Like we don't actually even have to use a clock to tell time. We can talk about the whole history of climate change by talking about how uh, kinship relationships uh, over time have 
been enriched or declined uh, or transformed or changed or adapted. Uh, and a lot of us have had the chance to talk to elders and to others who actually just can open up an entire history only talking about kinship relationships. So we can tell time that way. We can memorialize uh, through kinship as the primary marker of the duration or passage uh, of, of time. And so in this way, right, we can think of things as occurring on the speed of kinship. You know, for example, if I want Dr. Modest to give a presentation at my event, how long will that take me uh, to uh, see if that's something that, uh, that they can do? Well, as long as the kinship relationship is there, if, if we know each other from before, if we have trust and understand we respect our consent, maybe it'll happen immediately. Uh, if we don't know each other at all, um, maybe it's going to take a long time to build those uh, those qualities and to build that kinship. And so you can actually think of what it means for something to take a long time or a short time just based on kinship. And so kinship relationships escalate and they de-escalate and they signify how we experience intensity, right? Um, oppression and power against us is going to be experienced as intense uh, if, if the kinship relationships that we have have been threatened for some time, if, if, if we're still in a process of, of rebuilding those, the, the, those kinship relationships. Whereas if our kinship relationships are, 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 are rich and well-practiced, uh, then that's going to create a different experience and it's going to create a different conception of, of speed. And so kinship time is actually an exponential way of thinking about time. And a way what somebody can design or curate a, a kinship or a, a, a exhibition space um, instead of thinking of uh, you know linear time years or decades or centuries, you could actually create a space where time is being measured and told solely through uh, through kinship. And so when we think about kinship time, and this is just the last uh, thoughts that I have. Um, you know, if we're looking at the United States context, right, for the United States, they actively destroyed Anishinaabe and other indigenous kinship relationships because they didn't want to be opposed by indigenous people. And so from their perspective, we're living in a fantasy time, which is the last few hundred years of U.S. history when they uh, stopped indigenous threats to their existence and their settlement. Uh, and so for them, it's a fantasy time, which is why they're so urgent about responding to climate change or ignoring climate change, uh, depending on your position. Whereas for us, actually, uh, it's sort of wrong to present climate change as a threat in that way, because for us, we're actually in a dystopian period, <laughs> um, uh, but we don't necessarily think it's the only one. We recognize our past dystopias and the one we're currently living in right now uh, is just a, a dystopia caused by the United States and European powers and other groups that contributed to it. Uh, and so in this way, uh, our ancestors would have seen the destruction of so many kinship relationships due to US colonialism and said, well, we're in a dystopia. We're not in a, a normal state of affairs that we're trying to protect. We're not in a, 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 a society that is acceptable at all for us to want to return to it uh, or protect it from, from climate change or a pandemic or, or another threat. And so in this way, an exhibition space uh, can actually also tell time through thinking about these different phases of, of time and realizing that an exhibition on indigenous people, depending on the people, might be one talking about the heroics of responding to a, a dystopia. And so this is all about actually the timing of justice as exhibition spaces seek to, to change and transform in pursuit of, of, of justice and reconciliation and, and reclamation uh, and abolition. Uh, it's important to think very carefully about what it means to meditate on the, the time and the structure of time of an exhibition space. And there are a lot of alternatives out there, including the ones I mentioned. Uh, to having that dialogue. And I think what comes through when we transform how we think about time is that other conceptions of time are more conducive to, to caring and to kinship. Miigwech, good to have a chance to share with everybody. Hi. Hi, I think I am able again.
to, to speak. And I just wanted to, um, for us, try and hold on to some of the, the, con the concepts that were, were brought up by um, Professor White, thinking of first thing, uh, what is at stake in the question of first thing, um, which is, you know, in a way one could, in, in, in our other side of the work is, is, is how we very often, um, not only first, but we also know when to move on. So that temporality of first thing is something that is very interesting that we should come back to. Now, um, we want to come back definitely to the conversation around kinship and care and what is at stake in that relationship between kinship and care, a caring possibilities that improve the well-being and resilience of communities and do the best for communities. And, and um, just a closing remark, which I found really powerful, was to think through timing, the timing of justice, um, 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 Kylie just said. And I want us to come back to those. One of the things that I want to ask him to think about as we introduce our second speaker, Heather, and she's going to speak for, her 20, for 20 minutes, is what does he think is at stake in the museum, not only as an exhibitionary space, but also as a collecting space and as a space that works together with communities, what might it do to em embody these forms of kinship that he um, just, just, just proposed for us to think through. So kinship and the question of care. Our next speaker is Heather Igliolioti. And Heather comes to us um, from Montreal and we've been in an ongoing conversation because more than this project and Heather being here now, we sit in another set of conversations. <laughs> it, is, it is so wonderful to be able to be, have these global connectivities where we think through the museum as site for how we can imagine different worlds. Heather, welcome. And it's the, 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 the floor proverbially is yours. Go ahead. <laughs> um, am I a host? Can I share my screen? I will in a second. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Well, good morning for me. <laughs> it's 8 a.m. where I am. <laughs> I don't know where you are all tuning in the world from, but as Wayne just mentioned, I, I'd be in serious remiss if I didn't mention, if I didn't give a shout out to the Thinking Through the Museum project. <laughs> We're in the middle of a major grant application right now, and so maybe some of my colleagues are watching or will watch later. Um, today, I want to talk about a project that, or a couple of projects that I've been working on um, that have changed for me and changed the way I've been thinking about them since the beginning of the outbreak of the global pandemic and how those things um, are very much, I, I think about them holistically and how they're intertwined with the environment as I know many of you are as well. So let me just um, share my screen with all of you. And then uh, I'll note that I, I'm staying at an Airbnb in Winnipeg, so I'm, I'm here as a visiting scholar on my sabbatical. So I'm using my computer down here to read a couple of notes while I'm also showing you the presentation. So uh, bear with me if it looks like I'm not looking at you. I, I very much am. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll just note quickly that I am, I am an Inuk from Nunatsiavut. Is how you pronounce that, Wayne. And I am here from, I'm here right now on Treaty One territory in the homeland of the Metis in Winnipeg, uh, where the forks, the two rivers meet. And I am really excited to talk to you about the, the kind of curatorial ethics and environmental justice in relation to some of my own exhibition practices and the work of um, a research grant that I currently direct. And uh, some ideas that I've just started to have, so it's, it's, all very, it's all very new for me right now, but around how we could decrease the carbon footprint of internationally traveling exhibitions and other modes that, um, in addition to all of the very practical things we do have to do, how we might think creatively um, and experimentally around how to do this work. Even though I frequently do work with ethnographic collections, especially those from my own community, uh, I'm not a museum-based curator or an institutional curator. I'm an associate professor and research chair at Concordia University. Um, and so I'm an independent curator in that sense. And today I'm gonna to talk about some of the contemporary art curatorial practice that I've been doing. Um, but I do look forward to a conversation with all of you around how we could take what I'm talking about today and expand it to collections-based work. 
A lot of the literature that I found in doing some of the preliminary research for this presentation centers on environmentally sound practices for museums, uh, largely by looking at things that can be done with the buildings themselves. So greener building design, uh, the elimination of single use plastics, more eco-friendly materials, sustainability plans like reusing temporary walls instead of uh, creating a lot of waste and all kinds of practices, energy efficiency, the things that you're all familiar with. So for me, outside of the sort of, uh, you know, bricks and mortar issues that institutions have in becoming more, um, more compliant with environmental regulations, which hopefully will grow, um, I, one of the biggest costs for exhibitions, of course, is uh, for traveling exhibitions, is of course the travel, the travel and the transportation, the travel of, of people from place to place, and also of um, exhibition crating, which can be very expensive, has to be done to a particular standard, and then you know the heavier it is, the the greater the carbon footprint of something as it as it travels around the world by plane or by boat or by truck. So I'm gonna look at a couple of case studies from my own practice happening now and just share with you some of the thoughts that I've been having about them over the last eight months or so. And then you'll see how it is that I've arrived at where I am right now. Um, because of course the concept of going green in museums has long predated uh, the outbreak of the global pandemic. But I think that um, there have been some issues that have come to the fore that have highlighted the potential <laughs> in us slowing down um, and being more, uh, environmentally minded in all of our practices and also to think really consciously about our personal responsibilities uh, keeping in mind of course that the, the global capitalism is driving a lot of uh, what we can do but just what where can we land as individuals and feel um, that we're making the changes that need to be made. So I was actually, speaking of traveling internationally for exhibitions, I was actually traveling internationally for an exhibition when uh, COVID-19 did uh, break out. So that I was, if not my exhibition, of course, this is the 22nd Biennale of Sydney, Niren, curated by uh, Brooke Andrew. I don't know if you can see that on your screen, my picture's in the way here. Um, but Brooke Andrew is a uh, indigenous curator from Australia who did this incredibly tremendous project not just at the um, Art Gallery of New South Wales but at institutions all over uh, all over Sydney. Oh. Um, the exhibition itself took as its focus uh, as a indigenous led Bian Allen and one of the first in their very long history um, the dismantling of the inequality of the Eurocentric hierarchy in art. The Biennale of Sydney, the world's third oldest Biennale, is one of the highest profile arts festivals in all of Australasia. As the first in the region founded in 1973, the Biennale has long engaged with themes of globalization, environmental issues, uh, and others, but almost entirely through the direction up until 2017 and maybe once previous to that, uh, of European, of directors of European descent and of Western art historical tradition. This year, under the artistic director of Melbourne based First Nations artist curator Brooke Andrew, the 22nd Biennale of Sydney, titled Near and Meaning Edge in His Mother's Indigenous Wiradjundi Jury Language, um, is, was a really important first. So I was there and uh, actually cut my trip short, like I think a lot of other people did, as it was happening. Uh, the pandemic was sort of unfolding in real time all over the world. Our prime minister in Canada called people back um, a few days before I was meant to speak on a presentation. And so we came back to, I think, the state that a lot of people were all over the world, um, one of a really heightened anxiety, um, quarantine, <laughs> lockdown, and a, uh, a real shift towards isolation. And in my communities, that felt uh, particularly pertinent because um, isolation in Inuit, Inuit communities are already... Um, very remotely located. Inuit are, 98% uh, of Inuit communities in Canada are still fly-in or boat-in only or skidoo-in uh, over the ice in the wintertime. And so I was thinking about the sort of isolation of Inuit artists and the economic crisis that would be facing them in disproportionate ways because of how expensive it is to live in our own homelands. And then also thinking about the isolation of individuals and the, the real need for community that was, um, I just, I have to say, Kyle, I was so into your presentation just then. And I, the, the concept of, of a kinship time and how that relates to 
uh, relationship building and reciprocity and responsibility. That's a term that I'm, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to be citing you on that because it really perfectly aligns with um, some things that I, I will also be talking about. So uh, I direct the Inuit Futures in Arts Leadership Project. It is a 2018 to 2025, uh, seven years. It's a training and mentoring project that's meant to increase the number of Inuit and Inuvialuit in professional positions across the arts, basically any job for non-artists. And we were about a year and a half in, uh, maybe just a little bit over a year actually, when the pandemic outbreak began. And so within about a month, uh, after about a month after um, the initial panic, we, and thinking through with my team what it was that we could do, we decided to start, which, which of course a lot of people also started doing, which was uh, using Zoom for online gatherings. And so this was one of the very first ones, a very short, um, Melody uh, Hannah Siksik Lavalley's first, uh, this was just a stitch and bit, <laughs> and then it got larger as we um, started developing uh, other groups of people, other Inuit from all over coming in and, and wanting to participate. So this one was led by Kayla Bruce, who was in Rankin Inland at the time, and you can see there are Inuit and other Indigenous peoples from all over the country. Uh, joining us from across Inuit Nunanga, which is our homelands, and also southern Canada. We did a lot of what we would think of as kind of traditional skills-based training. This is, um, I don't know why that's rotating. Um, so some beadwork um, and then earrings. Okay, I've done something now to my presentation. Hold on, excuse me one second. Uh, but also, yeah, I don't know why I have a timer set on that. Um, but also things like graphic design, park making, uh, throat singing with other artists. Okay, what have I done? Uh, don't use timings. Did I fix it? <laughs> um, throat singing. Uh, a, a lot of all, all kinds of workshops. We had glass etching. We did makeup tutorials. Uh, we learned how to make pom-poms, but some of the things that we did that brought about some really great conversations, I think at, at most we might have had up to maybe 100 people, which was huge for a workshop, but usually we averaged maybe 25 to 50, 60 people uh, tuning in from all over, mostly in a week, but not entirely. Um, and then we had a big closing day event here on National Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. So we ran the workshops from the beginning of April until um, National Indigenous Peoples Day. And then we had a big closing event with live performances and uh, an open mic night. <laughs> it was uh, really fantastic readings from storytellers and so on. And some of the things that came up that I thought were really interesting was, you know, we had this uh, one cooking workshop with uh, Sheila Clu Sylvia Cluche, and um, we learned how to make uyuk, which is a Care, like a slow cooking caribou stew, which is delicious. And so a lot of the Inuit who are on the call were talking about uh, caribou or tuktu um, because we were thinking through how, they're not on an indigenous species yet list yet, but for us, they're very much, uh, we're very concerned about the caribou because we know that their spirit is quite um, skittish, that they are animals that uh, when a herd goes away, it, it, it's very difficult for it to bounce back in my territory. Uh, the George River herd when I was a kid was 120,000 strong and now it's like maybe five or 6,000, which is not enough for caribou. And we know that that's tied to resource extraction in our territories and mining development and uh, even just putting in roads and things that, um, that scare them away and then uh, make it very difficult for them to bounce back. We were also doing, speaking of sort of using all parts of the caribou. We we're also doing a caribou tufting workshop and in those conversations is when we really got into uh, talking about how precious these animals are and our land is to all of us and um, what impact the environment was having and even kind of speculating if COVID was having a positive or negative impact. Uh, like in Venice where the dolphins, no I'm just kidding, <laughs> well, I know that that was a hoax. <laughs> we, uh, I think that we were all at that same time, we were all kind of buying into this idea back in March and April that, um, that COVID was having this really dramatic climate um, revolution when I think it was maybe giving the earth a little bit of a break. But we do remember what Venice was really like in the fall of 2019, just a few months earlier when <laughs> the, the, this pretty poignant image on the left when um, 
Venice was flooding, you know, and Venice is an important critical contemporary art and global world heritage site. And I think this puts into pretty sharp relief what danger we are in of losing these places, you know, and as a, as a person who's very involved in the arts, I care about my environment, I care about the environment in Italy, I care about the environment in South America, and I see that these are all intimately intertwined and that ice melting in the Arctic is connected to forest fires in Los Angeles and uh, everything else that is happening globally and, and see the real urgency around, you know, better practices that we all need to um, embed through care in our work. I'd actually brought the Inuit Futures student group to Venice the summer before to see Isuma, the Inuit Video Collective, represent Canada for the first time ever that Inuit were there. And so this is a group of some of our amazing students and Inuit Futures faculty uh, on site watching the videos. The videos incidentally were very much around the, or not incidentally, <laughs> were very much around um, the global impact of resource extraction and how that was tied to the history of colonialism in the Arctic. So the main film that was showing was the story uh, one day in the life of Noah Puyuk, I have to look that up, um, but it was, um, that's a story that tells, that's a, a film that tells the story of an encounter, uh, you know, 40 years ago or 60 years ago, but uh, on the other side, what the students are watching in this video is, um, recordings of the mining consultations that were happening in the community today. And so what's one of the things that's really dramatic about this, <laughs> or that was really um, kind of shocking to the world around this piece, is that Asuma didn't come to the opening. They, they, they um, decided to stay in a glue lake and live stream from the ice edge, uh, from the flow edge, rather than um, show up in Venice. And I think that made a really bold statement around uh, where the center of the universe is for Inuit. Um, during that during that week, we also this is our our Inuit Futures annual gathering. So we also had a series of workshops, and we went to artist events and brought all the students to, you know, studio visits and the like. And one of the really highlights for me for that week was getting to meet the three Sami presidents who came and spoke with us. And Kyle, you had mentioned uh, in your presentation that um, talking about. Uh, not all sort of uh, new development around um, climate action is good or is uh, neutral <laughs> or is what it appears to be. And this is something that I really learned from the Sami presidents. They taught me a new term, which is green colonialism. And uh, green colonialism being the, um, the greenwashing of things that still are disenfranchising to indigenous people. So the example that they used is that uh, they are, the Sami uh, across the three nation states where they're that uh, cut across stop me right now are um, potentially going to lose their traditional reindeer herding territory to um, the installation of wind farms. <laughs> so it's that, that renewable energy that is coming in but is actually doing it at the loss of indigenous land, indigenous life, indigenous animals, the cost of pollution and water and so on. So the exhibition that I had on tour then, and which is still touring now, there's one venue left to get to, is Among All These Tundras. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, actually, my ad. Can somebody just pop on for a second? I, I didn't look when I started. Uh, I can pick it up. <laughs> um, the exhibition Among All These Tundras, which is curated by myself and my two co-curators who are also PhD students I'm working with. Uh, this exhibition, I'll just read a little bit about it. Among All These Tundras, a title taken from the poem My Heart Is In My Home by the famed Sami writer Niels Aslak Valkipa features contemporary art by indigenous artists around the circumpolar world. Together, their works politically and poetically express current Arctic concerns around land, language, sovereignty, and resurgence. Artists from throughout the circumpolar north share kinship with each other and their ancestors, love for their homelands, and respect for the land and its inhabitants. Yet they also share histories of colonialism and experience its ongoing legacies and are united in their desire to protect northern ecologies, languages, peoples, and knowledge from the nefarious effects of climate change, encroaching industry, and competition. These resistance efforts do not merely express, they give shape to a collective ecology of care, of decolonial love, to use uh, to cite Leanne Simpson and other scholars. That is, both gener that is both generous and generative. These works invite viewers to contemplate relationships between textual and embodied indigenous knowledges, innovation and sustainability, humor and resilience, 
and our collective responsibility to northern life and land. So that's um, what we wrote in 2018 about this exhibition. And that's uh, what we learned in uh, grouping these artists from around the circumpolar world together, including the new tech storage from Greenland uh, in both video and photography here. Sonia Keller Combs, who is an Alaskan based artist. Uh, Alison Okuchuk Warden, who is also a Nupiak from Alaska. This is her amazing performance, Siku Siku, where she performs in two parts. Uh, Siku is, uh, Siku means ice, but it's also slang for meth in her community. And so she plays two characters um, quite intimately, um, one who, who have gone in sort of different paths, but have that same foundation. Carol Gron, a Sami artist, Barry Pottle, an Inuk photographer who's very concerned with food sovereignty. A Sinayuk, um, a video and installation artist. Lakalu Williamson Bathory is a performance artist who sometimes works in video. This is an amazing piece. Um, Takralik Partridge, who also actually showed a, a similar series of these works in Niren, uh, just after doing this series for our installation. These are uh, like the beaded pieces that are not typically sewn onto an amounty, a mother's parka, but made in all different materials based on her life as an Inuk living in Sapi. Uh, sculptor and installation artist Kablusiak. You are Nango's Sami Shelters. Uh, Maria Hellander, I hope you've seen this film. Um, she had two pieces in the show, this is Birds in the Earth, uh, with the two Sami prima ballerinas who um, move from land to the steps of the legislature. And then the work that I really want to talk about here, um, which is Cousine Van Hoevelen's uh, comatic piece. This is a work that, so this is, this is the sort of end of my presentation now and, and where I'm getting with the idea of this, some speculative potential. So the last installation for this exhibition is meant to be at um, Pataka Art and Museum in New Zealand. And so this exhibition was supposed to travel uh, in a couple of months, it's actually going to travel next year now because, because of COVID, it was stopped, of course. But we were also thinking during that time that it gave us an opportunity to really think through how we were going to change our practices. Um, this is the largest work in the exhibition. It's the heaviest. As an Inuk curator, I already am thinking about things like how difficult it is to get um, natural materials, sculptural works, such as things made out of whalebone, over borders because of the international ban on um, some materials from Inuit homelands traveling to other places due to them being potentially from endangered species. It's really complicated. And so uh, we were already thinking through the exhibition that way and using a lot of digital work um, and thing, materials that could travel easily across borders and lightly. But this large sculptural piece uh, was gonna add a great cost and a great environmental cost to shipping. And so I was thinking about the, the point of this work. This is a, a traditional Inuit sled, but made out of pallet boxes. And we were, Cousine and I were talking through the sort of ubiquity of this kind of material, but also um, it, its sort of poignancy as, a, as an artwork talking about, you know, it brings in conversations around uh, the loss of sled dogs in the Arctic, which is a history you may or may not know. Um, the uh, difficulties that we have around the cost of food and traditional land-based gathering versus uh, commercially flown up food goods and so on. And so uh, one of the ideas that we talked, and also the <laughs> speaking of ubiquity in the Arctic, the number of places that you can find pallets um, and sort of images like this um, and, and what they mean for Inuit. And so we were thinking through um, what that, what that means and, and what message they carry because it's all, it is very intimately tied to our food sovereignty. This is just, uh, I'll just leave this slide up for a second so everyone can have a chance to look at some of the outrageous prices that people in the North have to pay for food. This is a $104 for a case of water, which seems excessive. And then you have to consider that sometimes our communities are on boil water advisories and we can't actually drink water that comes out of the tap. That happens more often than not. Uh, $20 for bag of flour, $30 for grapes, $30 for cabbage, $17 for peanut butter. Um, and so you see this, this is from one of the protests that have been happening with greater frequency uh, from the group Feeding My Family, which you can look up on Facebook. $2,000 to feed, $2,000 a month to feed my family is forced poverty. So thinking through all of those kinds of things, but then also how can we um, deal with this and still have this work 
um, tour with the exhibition, decrease the cost of that, and then also potentially bring attention to this issue in a different kind of a way. And so I was thinking about, um, you know, because palettes really are everywhere all over the world, could we potentially have someone remake the work? And I was thinking about, you know, a conceptual artist such as Saul DeWitt who sent instructions for works and would um, send instructions for his wall drawing series, for example, that started in the 1960s. Um, here you see the instructions for wall drawing from the Boston Museum, which is just, you know, put 50 points on a wall. And then here's another one on the other side, the 104, which is again, like make a number of lines going in various directions. You know, just that, that idea that we could, maybe we could um, think through the creation of works that are conceptually um, sound, but that are potentially made in other contexts or made through instructions. And is there a potential here for us to be sharing without traveling you know, due to COVID and sharing without traveling uh, due to the environmental cost of that? And, and what could that look like? And how is that implicated in care? Um, another example that I, I really, really fond of this project and uh, that I deeply admire is Nadia Mears. Uh, she's an Indigenous Canadian artist who did this project at the McCord Museum in Montreal, Decolonial Gestures or Doing It Wrong. And in this project, she um, had a series of Victorian women's magazines from the 1800s. And then she had uh, staff at the museum read the instructions in French or English aloud, uh, but to take out any reference to what the thing was that she was actually making. And then Nadia would uh, recreate the piece based just on the instructions. And I think that that has led to some pretty incredible kinds of things. One of the things that Saul DeWitt was always thinking through was that um, you could follow the instruct. everyone can follow the instructions directly, but everyone would make something a little bit different. And I think that that's a, a sort of a creative ethic that Nadia was also working through in this project. Mir um, did this installation. You can see that it includes both video work of the making as well as the production of actual works. And so I've been talking through with Cousine and he's decided that he would like to pursue this avenue for uh, shipping this work. And so, you know, this is an exhibition that's already in progress. So it, there's a limit to what I can do with it, but I think that there's potential for the future. Um, and then Cousine and Allison are once again, they're actually gonna work together now on a new project that I'm doing with the Winnipeg Art Gallery which is opening the Inuit Art Center, which you can see here on the left is the um, architectural rendering and on the right is in progress. It's actually much more finished than that image on the right. And they are, this is a meeting that we had <laughs> just a, a, maybe a month ago where they were thinking through how they can continue to uh, collaborate across borders without travel and uh, with minimal cost for transportation. And I, I can't tell you what it is, but I do know that they're really invested in this idea of the Inupiaq blanket toss. This is, um, you can see here, it's a, a giant blanket made through, uh, made that is suspended by the entire community to toss people <laughs> up in the air like this. This is Marjorie Tabo and another artist that I've worked with um, taking home the championship. And so I can't tell you what it is that they're going to do, but I, I'm really excited about the potential future of uh, collaborative work that doesn't see these uh, challenges as limitations, but as possibilities. I think I went over my time and I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Heather. No, you, 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 you were spot on with your timing, so that's fine. And Great. <laughs> the challenges. Um, as we come back, um, I want to pick up um, a little bit on your investment in questions of endangerment. So you, you tie questions of extraction to a certain kind of endangerment, whether or not mm. it is to, 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 to people or to animals or um, to, to Inuit cultures. There's that I really love. So you say resource extraction and its relationship to endangerment. Um, I'm very interested in where you ended, where you speak to the question of collaboration across borders and those collaborations that can still be caring. And what is at stake in caring collaborations that are across borders and I want to push you a little bit to take that the border as really conceptual border um, in, in its multiple ways, not just in its geography, but in, in, in other forms of thinking borders as well as we come back. Um, and I, um, the, is there a potential here to share without traveling? You said it goes back to 
the questions of collaboration across across different borders. So I want to come back to those those ideas later on, and also um, just to to shout out to the amazing work that you were showing as well in um, in, in the in the exhibition and what does that kind of work invite us to do as our kind of museum as we try to imagine our work uh, more um, more caring and carefully. And lastly, the questions of colonial, green colonialism, which is a term, I think that if I remember correctly, there was a book that was already published probably sometimes in the 90s and the author has died recently where um, that was exactly, recently died, that was exactly one what was at stake in, in, in in his um, writings as well to try and um, think through how these questions of environmentalism is also em embedded in a kind of coloniality, a project of coloniality. So that's also another thing. So I want to move now to our third and final speaker and um, Rolando Vasquez. And as I said before, Rolando works um, at the Roosevelt, um, University College Roosevelt and also um, is part of more generally of the Faculty of Humanity at the Utrecht University and a long-standing friend of the RCMC. Rolando, we invite you to challenge us. So it's over to you. Thank you. And we, we, the session finishes at 4.30, right? So... Go ahead. Go ahead and... and, and <laughs> just want another well, I'm, going, I'm going to stop you after 20 minutes, Rolando. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go if I needed to recover time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming to this virtual meeting. It's a bit strange to be talking on my own, but I imagined you there. Um, I want to start by saying, by expressing my gratitude to the center. It's been a home of conversation for quite a long time already, as Wayne was mentioning. And I will address one of the key questions that was in the invitation, and is the question of what knowledge does the museum ignore? And uh, with the idea that uh, there will be no earth justice without epistemic justice. So uh, in, through the decolonial framework that is the approach I use and to which I belong, uh, we connect the necessity of epistemic justice to earth justice. So basically, uh, following also the presentation of Kyle, the, we cannot see the destruction of earth as separated from a particular epistemic framework, a particular knowledge framework that has been dominant since Western colonialism. So I will uh, address this question and try to get to what is at stake in the museum, particularly in the ethnographic museum. So the, the invitation or the presentation of this uh, conference spoke as well of the brutal legacies of colonialism. And I will start just putting a common um, framework where we can begin our conversation. For us, I mean us, a whole group of people thinking around these issues, gravitating around the question of the decolonial, we see that this uh, legacy of colonialism is connected to two major um, movements. One is the movement of Eurocentrism and the other the movement of anthropocentrism, both belonging to the Western model of civilization. Eurocentrism, as has already been mentioned, Eurocentrism is connected for us, its colonial side, its uh, implication, its violence is the loss of other worlds of meaning. So the affirmation of a single world and the loss of other worlds of meaning. 
So Eurocentrism for us is directly connected to the loss of worlds and what we call worldlessness, the condition of worldlessness. On the other hand, anthropocentrism is um, let me take a note of that. On the other hand, anthropocentrism is connected to the loss of the earth. So the dominance of the human over the earth and earth beings leads us to the condition of earthlessness. So the two pillars of the modern Western modern project, that is the pillar of anthropocentrism or humanism and the pillar of Eurocentrism lead us to a generalized condition of worldlessness and earthlessness. This is what expressed for us uh, the, con the general condition of coloniality, the violence of the destruction of worlds and the destruction of earth cannot be separated from the history of the colonial project. Here I would like to use an example, just a brief image for us to understand. And is the historical moment of the plantation. So for example, if we think the plantation in the Caribbean, you see these two pillars uh, colliding. The pillar of Eurocentrism being expressed through racism, through the discrimination and the devaluation of the life of other people. Next to the pillar of anthropocentrism and earthlessness, transforming the earth and the transforming ecosystems into monocultures, into plantations. So in the plantation system, you see the destruction of earth and the destruction of worlds as the material ground of the Western project of civilization. So this is the context, just a very brief introduction to the modern modernity coloniality way of thinking. And this historical order is an order that is not, so the order where we see the plantation is an order that is not separated from the logic of the museum. And particularly here, we are talking of the ethnographic museum. So the ethnographic museum, just as the plantation, partakes in this worldlessness and this earthlessness. And it has a very big responsibility today to confront these questions. So I will try to show how the museum is implicated in this. I was reading a few weeks ago with my students a passage that Sarah Ahmed writes in one of her latest books that is called What's the Use, where she speaks about care, which is the main topic of the conference, but the possibility of plunder as care. And she particularly talks about the museum. She says, we could think of museums as where objects are stripped of use and put on display. It is not just that objects are stripped of use, but that the communities for whom objects matter are stripped of what matters to them. The word strip points to the violence of this history. It derives from the West Saxon bestripan, meaning plunder. Taking care can mean taking things. Theft are justified as taking care of things by taking them out of use. So here is one big question. Could we follow this history of the museum as a history of care that is a narrative of care that justified the death and the plunder of other cultures? Moreover, I think the function of the ethnographic museum, as I have talked in previous conferences in this, in this context of the Center for Material Culture, is connected to this, um, this transformation of the function of the object. So the ethnographic museum displaces 
puts out of place, out of use, objects of the worlds of meaning that are stripped from their objects, as Ahmed says. It is a movement of appropriation of other worlds to subject them to the order of representation of modernity. It enframes and it encloses the worlds of meaning into an order of classification, into a collection order, into an exhibition order, into a chronology. It subjects them to this time that Kyle was speaking about, the chronological time of modernity. So this, this, this function of the museum, the ethnographic museum, is largely, we can see it as the fo function of owning and representing the other. And by doing this, I, I have asked several times, we need to ask the question of whiteness. What is doing, what is this museum, this ethnographic museum doing in its social function by owning and representing the other? In our thinking, it is producing whiteness. It is producing the public as white and it is producing whiteness as a historical subjectivity that belongs to the default position, to the locus of enunciation that learns and becomes the governing gaze, the all-powerful gaze, the gaze that can own the world through its perception that can classify the world. It is the practice of whiteness as owning, as ownership, as property, as being the owner of property. So we'll make a quick side note here to say that the, the bringing the object of worlds into display and representation and classification is very different from the logic of the art object because the art object in the West is itself made for exhibition. Like, like the, the art, the contemporary art we just saw in Heather's presentation, it is a work that is made for representation. However, the ethnographic object, the object that is collected in the ethnographic museum, is not made for representation. It is subject to the order of representation of the Western gaze and the Western system of classification. So one of the things that gets lost in this ignorance of the, that the museum produces is the primacy, it establishes the primacy of an object as representation and it loses the knowledge that all those objects had, maybe not all, but many of those objects had, that were objects not made with the logic of a design in many cultures, but were objects that express a relation. They are objects of deep relations of community, of relationality, of forms of relating to the earth, to the ancestral, whose main objective was not to enter an order of exhibition, and much less to become the object of consumption of the white gaze. So what do we need uh, when we ask what the, what the museum should do? I think one of the key questions here is to enact an epistemic shift, a decolonial epistemic shift. For this, I will read a, a little passage from our dear friend, Maria Lugones, who recently died. And uh, just to see what she means by uh, this violence, this epistemic violence that the West performs and that we will recognize very easily in relation to the ethnographic museum. She's speaking about a different topic, but I think the passage really uh, serves us very well here. She says, there is no epistemic shift to other worlds of sense, precisely because they perceive, imagine, 
only the exotic, the other, the primitive, and the savage. And there is no world of sense of the exotic, the other, the savage, and the one in need of salvation separate from the logic of domination. Those conception of, conceptions of others are inextricably connected to epistemic imperialism and aggressive ignorance. So I would like to ask the question, I know there are many people from many museums here, how is the ethnographic museum implicated in this epistemic imperialism and this aggressive ignorance? So now I want to turn to, I mean, here is one of the elements I want to highlight that is decolonizing the ethnographic museum has to engage with this sort of question, with its positionality and with really practicing a decolonial form of critique, one that cannot ignore its history. So how can we do an epistemic shift if all the terms of classification and collection belong to this logic of domination, to this epistemic imperialism and this aggressive ignorance? Maria Lugones in another passage helps us a little bit. And she speaks about disengagement. So the condition of quietness as a condition of disengagement, I would say, a sort of arrogant ignorance. She says, disengagement as a sanctioned ethnocentric racist strategy works as follows. You do not see me because you do not see yourself. So disengagement is a radical form of passivity towards the ideology of the ethnocentric racial state that privileges the dominant culture as the only culture to see with and conceive this seeing as to be done non-self-consciously. So basically, this form of exhibition, of classification, of controlling what is seen and what is not seen, produces a type of disengagement that is complicit with a racist order. And what um, the problem here, if I were to turn the, the question of, um, I would I would use a, a quote from Fanon to turn this question a bit, because the question of the ethnographic museum is the question from the site of privilege. That's why I'm speaking of the historical construction of whiteness. So in this text, uh, in this series of lectures of Ngugi Guationgo, his Global Ethics book, he quotes this very famous passage from Fanon and the Wretched of the Earth, where he says, because it is a systematic negation of the other person and a furious determination to deny the other person all attributes of humanity, colonialism forces the people it dominates to ask themselves the question constantly, in reality, who am I? Well, this is a question of Fanon from the perspective of the colonized. But if we were to turn this reflection towards the ethnographic museum in the face of the manifestation of coloniality as worldlessness and earthlessness, we would need to ask the question, if we have been produced through the negation of the other person, in reality, who have we become? What have we become in this order? And I would say we have become, listening to First Nations or indigenous philosophies, I would say that we have become 
ignorant of the world, we have become orphans of the earth, and we have come to an enclosure where we have lost, where we have lost time, the time of ancestrality, the time of where we all come from. So if um, if the museum was to engage seriously with these questions, it would need to engage in a process of what our friend um, Elder also Arturo Escobar speaks about, which is a process of transition. How could we envisage a transition towards a museum that becomes a site of decolonial critique? Because it does have a lot of information about the construction of the modern colonial order. It is itself an instrument of it. How can we think of a museum that can practice that can have an active practice of positionality, that is of recognizing how it has been implicated and how we are implicated and how its publics are implicated in arrogant ignorance, in epistemic violence. Could we think of a museum that can practice, actively practice listening? across colonial divides. What would it mean to move from the logic of owning the world to the logic of owing to the world, of owing to the earth? This we see as a possibility of a transition towards serious questions of social justice, epistemic justice, and also earth justice. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks Rolando. I mean, there is so much that you brought in as a kind of also riffing on in relationship to the other presentation. And I want to just hold on to two things. A logic of what does it mean for a museum like ours to move from a logic of owning to the world to a logic of owing the world. I want to hold on to that one as we think about our own implicatedness, as you said, suggestion, you suggested as active participants in the kind of epistemic imperialism and aggressive ignorance. And you ask the question, what does it mean? What has this kind of work of epistemic imperialism made us? What have we become? So there's a whole heap to think through and to riff on. And we could talk forever now. So we're going to talk as much as we can until um, you all say that you have to go somewhere else or scream at me that we need to stop, we need to stop. <laughs> and perhaps I want to open by, because there are a few questions that are coming from audiences and that's fine, but I want to open by asking whether or not, for example, any of you would like to respond to the other persons um, with questions or comments. Um, I am interested, we are interested to try and end up to think through what an ethics of care could mean. And you've given us a lot of ways of thinking about that. But for perhaps, Kyle, you want to say something to Heather or otherwise around as we start out with a conversation. Any of you? Yeah? Yeah, I, I appreciate the, <laughs> the, the, the chance to, uh, to connect. And I, I, I was... Um, <clears throat> Well, well, this was a question that was um, uh, put to me by <laughs> by by Wayne, um, but uh, but I'm actually curious because I, I really enjoyed uh, Heather's presentation and the the philosophies as well as just the uh, you know indigenous artists and you know and, and all the hard work and collaboration and 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 partnership that that goes uh, goes into that work. 
Um, I, 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 I was wondering in, in your presentation, um, Heather, and I mean, I asked this also to, uh, to, to uh, it, or to Rolando, but, but, um, you know, I, like I focused a lot in my presentation on like exhibition spaces, but then uh, Wayne sort of challenged me with the idea of, of the actual collections themselves. Um, and I'm wondering in, in, in your work, how the issue of like collections or archives is, is, is related. <laughs> so, um, I think that, I mean, I think that that's one of the things I was hoping that we could have a conversation with, and I'd, I'd love to hear what Wayne has to say about it. But for me, I, I think about, you know, like collections is a kind of a blanket term for what a lot of Indigenous peoples in, um, in where I'm from and other places might think of as relatives or cultural belongings, community belongings, as uh, ancestors as things that have uh, a spirit or that we belong to or that we are responsible to. And so to, to think about them as collections is really to, um, to need to think about what those collections want <laughs> and, and what they need. You know, I, I remember being a fellow at the, what was then the um, Museum of Civilization in uh, Gatineau in Quebec. And, uh, I had the opportunity to bring in a couple of uh, performers, um, musicians, not musicians, but dancers that I know, who came in to visit the collections of the national institution. And they sang to their ancestors in the space. And, you know, so thinking about um, what it means to be responsible to those collections has been, is something that's really um, significant to me because I, I think through not just you know what it is as like the stuff, but also um, if it's clothing, like who was the wearer, if it is an object that potentially came out of a funerary site, you know what is its responsibility or our responsibility to it inside of a museum, and where have these things traveled to? You know we're talking about European collections. You know there's there are Inuit. Uh, or Inuit collections in every museum in the world as far as, I've never been to one that didn't have at least, you know, a drawer of ivory miniatures or a code or something from the circumpolar world. And so um, I think a lot about what are those things doing there and how did they get there? And was it through trade? Was it through exchange? Was it through, you know, participation in a human zoo? <laughs> like all the different kinds of ways that our, our things are mobilized around the world. And, um, yeah, so when I think about environmental justice in relation to these objects, I, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot that's wrapped up also in what Rolanda was saying about, you know, how, how these broader issues of justice are all tied into how those collections come into being. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Kyle. Yeah, no, yeah, no, it's good to hear your points because it was, um, well, I had a lot, a lot of things I, I, <laughs> I'd, I'd say in, in, uh, you know, kind of response to that, given like my own experiences and like everything you were saying really like um, rings true to me and, and something I see out, uh, out there, um, you know, that the, your earlier points um, brought up is kind of this idea that oftentimes I'll see something that like an Indigenous artist did or an Indigenous curator did. And the, the exhibition space they set up is, you know, incredible, right? It's, it's anti-colonial, it's, it's generative of Indigenous thought and philosophy. But then it's kind of just a, a, an afterthought that maybe they they had to spend all this time in a heavily colonial archive for some of the material for it, right? And while I know some people do tell those stories of their encounters with the archive, oftentimes like non-Indigenous people don't, they're not actually curious about that component of it. And just like listening to what you were saying, Heather, about actually what was the experience and the story of actually encountering the archive or the collection? Um, and how is it that in the exhibition space, that experience, not only can be reflected on, but then, you know, how can it be part of changing? Uh, you know, I agree. We have to change with the word first, right? <laughs> collection. Um, but anyways. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, collection implies ownership, you know, rather than uh, being held in trust or being honored or anything else. So even, even like you're saying that, that the sort of fundamental underpinning of the words that we choose to use to classify is in itself a, a colonial outcome. 
Yes, I think it, it is really important that we look at the genealogy or the history of the notion of collecting, because I don't see in, in any way how that could be an indigenous term, you know, and how it belongs to a history of appropriating the world, you know, and classifying. And, uh, and in a way, how a system that is collecting artifacts is the same system that is destroying the, what we might call the archives for the indigenous people, right? Like the mountain, the river, the deer, where uh, many, many cultures think of them as their living archives. You know, the, these are the sites of their memory, their ancestrality, and they are not reducible to a collection or to a museum, you know. However, the, the museum wants to preserve things that that don't necessarily, um, that belong to a different, um, it introduces them in a different temporal order that is not the order of time of the vernacular where these memories are preserved, where ancestrality is alive. So, so I, I think it is important to distinguish the logic of the museum and its, its aim at appropriating and collecting how it runs in uh, counterways to the necessity of uh, preserving memory and the vernacular life, right? That cannot be done by that, by a museum. So I think we also need to see the limits of, right. of the museum. But I, I mean, I, I would be interested in that as well, eh? because um, that is that is actually, a, there is a, a core, that question is at the core of the current project of which our conversation is embedded. And, um, and, and the question of whether or not and what forms of relationship can the museum have in terms of supporting that, 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 imagine, that, 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 that possibility, right? So it, it might be that a genealogy of the question of collecting um, needs to be done to unpack and distill what, what we mean, you know, when we speak about what is a collection, what is an artifact, you know, and, and if, give, um, go back to acknowledgement that many of these objects are not just objects, right? They are also subjects. So that's, that, that, that I think is a part of the work that we need to do and why we are having this conversation. But there's something else that you're suggesting, which is if it is so that there is a, and this ties back to Kyle's question in the beginning about a certain kind of kinship, a certain kind of kinship as care, is it possible for the museum to be a part of that kinship relationship? Can the museum support that kind of kinship relationship? How, how do museums um, um, participate in the sustenance of such careful and caring relationships? Or is that an impossibility already because of its starting point as a colonial logic? Well, it's a, it's a challenging question, right? Because if you start there, you're taking the genealogy of collections, then the end point is going to be, why do you still have these things? <laughs> you know, like the the the, uh, the inevitable outcome is going to cause a crisis in collecting practices entirely. Because you know, I think for that for a lot of indigenous peoples worldwide, they they just want their stuff back. <laughs> so it's a it's a difficult question to engage with because the the foundation of it um, is underpinned by. Uh, you know, the sort of unjust circumstances under which collections are amassed, you know, like hoarding. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't. The, uh, that, that restitution is a part of a just future. That, that is, many museums are awakening to that as well. So I wouldn't want to foreclose it by saying that it, it, I don't think that, well, not all museums necessarily aren't afraid that if this conversation happens, then it is going to become empty. That is <laughs> not, not a fear that we have. We work with an, uh, a Maori artist who said, you can give back some objects. And if, we, if, you, if you return some objects, then it is, it is for the, the, the Maori community from which he's from. To, to give back some objects to the museum. So there are many ways of imagining what a possible future could look like, I think, in that regard. 
Um, I just wanted to say that there's this, there's this amazing article whose author I don't recall, and I'm very sorry, but it was a, a director of a museum writing from 100 years in the future and reflecting on when they went through the process of uh, doing 3D scans of everything in their collection and keeping the scans in the museum and returning all of the objects, all of the belongings to communities. And it was just like this totally, it, just a short little thing. I'll see if I can find it on the internet later, but just this kind of beautiful idea about what that process was like and then uh, how transformative technology could be to these conversations. Yeah, yeah. No, and I would be interested in, in, in also having that kind of discussion because I think that that is where we, we also have to think about this, this the, the, our embeddedness in the idea of the real, of the authentic, of all of those narratives which we use and what is at stake in that in terms of what it is the purpose we even say we want to achieve. So in that, that is something. But another part of our discussions later on will be to go exactly into what you said, Heta, which is about, you know, how do we define these categories of gift, of exchange, of, of purchase, of whatever, within the context of colonial regimes? Because I think that that is also an important conversation that needs to be had as well. Um, well, up on your first okay. question, is that okay? Yeah, yeah um, definitely. Well, first, I would say, with regard to Heather's good points, if there was an empty museum, I would definitely purchase a ticket to to go there. <laughs> um, so I, I I agree with Heather's points. Um, I also wanted to talk about some other dimensions of kinship just briefly. So one thing about kinship is like on the one hand, so there's, you know, um, like particular indigenous people often use the term kinship to describe, you know, their ethics, their sense of place, their sense of relationality. Um, you know, but the, the, a, another way though is that kinship is also something that across different cultures we can talk about as a um, kind of like a category or a domain of, um, like of, of ethics and, and how we relate to each other. And one that actually in countries like the United States, uh, you know, is particularly lacking, right? So if you're working in an institution, a lot of us have rights and a lot of us have legal protections in those institutions. Uh, but actually the reason why we're harassed or traumatized or abused is because the people we work with um, uh, don't have kinship with us, so they don't care about our consent. They don't care about being trustworthy. They don't care about being reciprocal. They don't care about other kinship qualities like transparency or respect for privacy, um, accountability, uh, among others. And so, a lot of Western institutions, right, are confronting the fact that at a certain level, they may have thought themselves to be very uh, 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 liberal or enlightened, and I'm thinking of universities here, but almost every other, yet they were literally harboring the most violent forms of interpersonal abuse. And it occurs at a lot of different levels. And I think in museum and collection spaces, if somebody's visiting uh, an exhibition or a collection or an archive as a traumatizing experience, uh, that's not a kinship approach, right? Um, um, and so I, I, I'd like to see that conversation uh, happening, especially in a context where oftentimes I've heard uh, white people talk about their visiting colonial archives. And even though they were saying so in a spirit of social justice, they were also almost like looking at these archives as kind of a triumphant, you know, kind of colonial past that they were, you know, sort of like, tapping into, right, and not really thinking of a more traumatizing experience an indigenous person or a black person or a Latinx person would, would feel. The other thing I just want to mention quickly about kinship, too, is that in terms of the, um, the processes of rematriation and restitution that uh, Heather was referring to, I think in other areas, even for the curators and museum leaders that want to go in that direction, they also have to deal with the reality that they don't have the kinship in terms of partnership to actually facilitate some of those processes. Uh, and so oftentimes I've talked to curators or people in other areas who are confused by the fact that they don't know, they can't figure out who the, the right people are uh, to engage with, or, or they, you know, they're, they're sort of puzzled by all of these problems, right? Right, which have occurred in the wake of, of colonialism. And eventually, uh, the more they get frustrated, they will just blame the indigenous people for that. Instead of realizing that actually there is a problem 
of kinship that's going to take time to solve. Uh, something as complex in a lot of cases as rematriation, uh, repatriation, or restitution uh, is going to depend and start from the relationships that are already there. <laughs> um, and what that means to confront the potential lack of, of relationality is itself a challenge of, of, of kinship. It's a lack of coordination, a lack of capacity to, to act together. Uh, and I think that that's something that I've seen a lot of non-Indigenous uh, curators uh, struggle with in practice. And my suggestion is, right, that the act of fulfilling or establishing kinship itself should be what's desired, um, even if that means there are certain things one might not be able to achieve in their lifetime. Um, I mean, okay. I mean, you know, the the the, the there has been in 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 many, all right. Let me let me go to questions that are coming out from the audience. So one person asked, "Is it possible to?" give back ancestral meanings to objects exhibited in ethnologic museum for centuries? Is it possible to, to, to go back to ancestral meanings? Um, for centuries, probably belonging to communities already um, that no longer exist. Is it possible for the modern institution of museums to present inside their infrastructure these objects in their fully meaningful way? That is one question that they, somebody asked. And, um, who wants, Roland, do you want to take that up, probably? Well, I think uh, two, two things here. One is, um, so what all those objects can tell very well is not necessarily their ancestral history, but they can tell their colonial history, you know? They can be, they are witness, they testify to colonial violence and to expropriation, to an order of representation. So for me, the ethnographic museum has to turn into that, into a showcase of that system that aim to appropriate the world and classify the world. It also has to do the second level of the question is what we've been calling the humbling of modernity. You know, so it is not as if the museum or the university now will take the lead in kinship. I think the museum has to understand its limits and its own positionality and has to work within those limits. So that is the, the other element that I think is very important. And finally, I mean, because our last conversation here was with Arturo Escobar, I think we also need an awareness of the epistemic border, or what Escobar will call the different ontologies, you know? So uh, an object that is rematriated, repatriated, or restituted doesn't do that to take the same value and the same function that it has in the institution, right? If it goes into that transition, it enters another ontology and another world of meaning. And it is, and that meaning is not for the museum to decide. It is for the community that will receive it, right? So it is not a claim of absolute authenticity that it will go back to the ancestors where it was, you know? So the process of restitution is not that simple, I think. It has to do with a humbling and an awareness of opening these processes. All right, I want, to, I want to close with one last question because I think we are really right at the end of it now. And the question actually is for you, Heather. It says, concerning exhibitions, apart from shipping temporary exhibitions, what would this mean for future acquisitions to collections? Not only in terms of shipping the objects to their new owners, but also in terms of conservation, storage, and um, all of these questions. So what does that new ethics um, that you are proposing with exhibitions, what, what broader, I think the person is asking, what broader consequences does it have for a museum? That's what they are asking. This is Martin Schultz who is asking this. 
Hi, Martin. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think if we're if we're thinking about the, I, I'm assuming we're talking about the idea that we, we're doing with cuisines work that might be extract that could be extrapolated out, outward. You know, which is limited by the fact that it's an existing work in an existing exhibition. It's current already on tour, and so the you know it's not like the artwork was designed to be recreated, but we're we are thinking through how to do that part to sort of take this large and heavy thing and transport it without having to physically transport it but if you but you know we uh, in conversations with cuisine and allison and others i've been talking about this and like what would the actual implications of this be if we were to take this uh the, to go back to that kind of 1960s <laughs> 1970s conceptual art frame and think about um you know because you think it, it you think it becomes sort of objectivity but there is a lot of subjectivity in it and so even if it's not an artist exchange but an artist having say there's an exhibition and there are five artists and they're making the, the works in five different locales, you know, does they, who is the owner of the work in that situation? Who, be, who becomes the owner? Who has the right to sell? Who has the right to acquire? Is, is, it, is it multiples? <laughs> is it all the intellectual ownership of the artist? These are things that uh, I think would need to be carefully negotiated with the artists prior to doing a project like this. But I also think that there's a lot of exciting implications for it you know and uh, i think if you if artists were had the opportunity to um to know that that was what they were entering into that it, we might generate a lot of different ways of uh doing and, and being with this work um for example i can imagine it's it's right now like i i, I love what artists respond to collections like nadia muir's piece <laughs> like you know and going in and, and doing it the way that she did not to the actual things in the collection but the text in the collection of these victorian women's journals and the sort of instructional kind of thing i think there's something really fascinating in that process um because that was something that at the time people were also all doing kind of blindly you know like just sort of following instructions printed in a magazine by people generated by people who are non-indigenous following how to create something else so there, there's already that kind of translation that's happening in the yeah. exhibition and I, I think i think we could probably come up with all kinds of different ways to do it and uh i just you know, I just like the idea of having a bit of fun <laughs> with doing this kind of work instead. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so much of the reality is that we are we are in crisis, we're in ongoing crises, and uh, just thinking through the idea of thinking about it as a possibility instead of as a a challenge that uh, that leaves us in a deficit all the time. But I, I hope mean, that answers your question. I don't know the answers. Is the thing, no, no, is no, it? but it's fine, actually, because you led me to something which is where I would love to close. And, and there is one last question, which we probably can get into another time, which is that if someone says examples of Amazon, from the Amazon shows that indigenous peoples want some of their objects to be in museums and create kinds of kinship with people in museums in, in Europe. Um, how do we think about that? But that, that's probably something we, we have to get into later on. But one thing that you, you suggested, Heather, which I think is a really interesting closing point for us is, is the, personally from the museums and mindful of what you all says, I, I don't want to suggest that we should ha have some fun. I think we should, we should also be aware in the humbling that, that Ronaldo asked for us to think through what is at stake in our own practice and the histories that we, we are complicit in. However, what you suggest is also the fact that we need to be able also to participate in the imagination of other possible worlds, of other possible futures, of more equitable spaces for futures to happen where this, this Eurocentrism is not the center. And I think that that might be, in some ways, demand us to, to move to a certain kind of imagination, which could be more fun in a certain sense, right? That one can speculate, one can imagine, and, and not always be feeling as museums that we are on the battlefield struggling against people who want their things back, but rather a part of our process to imagine what the future could be in another way, right? A part of more just futures, which is a horizon more hopeful than one that is defensive. So I want to thank you um, all for, for provoking us, and now that I've heard all of you, um, it leaves me personally in the museum uncomfortable, which is what exactly I want. 
<laughs> we move on. And I hope everybody here who is a, a curator in this session feels similarly uncomfortable about what we say we want to do. But I want to also invite you, perhaps later on as we push this project forward, if we could come back to a more closed discussion, how we can work these things out. Because I'm interested in the active workings that what would it mean, what would it look like when um, we take that kind of kinship seriously and we start building trust, we start building humility, we start building, um, moving from conceit to a, 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 a concept that takes that violence seriously rather than what we sometimes do in our museums, which is to say, oh, there is a lot of, sorry, sorry, I'm not being critical of us, but I am. When we say, oh, there's a lot of agency that we can find in the collection. Yes, there is, but we shouldn't find agency to support our own cause. We should find agency to support the lives of the peoples who have been, who are precarious. So thank you for, for being with us. And it's going to continue because as curators, we're going to now meet after this meeting and discuss what are the implications and we'll get back to you. Hopefully you'll join us again as we try to think this together. And I hope that you can know, it's, I know it's early morning someplace. <laughs> so sorry for waking you up too early. <laughs> Thank you for this conversation. I'm sorry, I have a very bossy senior dog who is barking at me. To oh, that's all right. That's adjust her pillows for her. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Heather. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wayne. All right, bye. Bye. -bye.